can't help it. I just like that better than I'd like to call the November 21st, 2019, Pickle City School Board of Education meeting to order. Mr. Hiddle, please call the roll. Mr. Patrizio. Here. Mr. Ford. Here. Mrs. McMacken. Here. Mr. Bostick. Here. Mr. Height. Here. Will you please stand and join me in the pledge? I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Okay, you've had a chance to look at the meet minutes from the October 30th meeting and also the November 10th work session. Are there any additions and corrections to those minutes? If not, can I have a motion to approve, please? So moved. Do we have a second? Second. If there's no further discussion, all in favor, please signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed? Motion carries. Any changes to the agenda? We did add the executive session at the end to do the um, evaluation of the treasurer. Okay. And we'll, we'll take no action when we come out of that executive Correct. session. All right. Do we have a motion to approve the agenda? So moved. Do we have a second? Second. Okay, we have a motion and a second. If there's no further discussion, all in favor, please signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed? Motion carries. Okay. Real quickly, on November 10th, uh, before the... Um, Capital Conference in Columbus, uh, we met for an extensive work session in the afternoon. Got a lot of, we covered a lot of topics. Um, one of the things we talked about were sports facilities, you know, with the coming perhaps changes to uh, locations and things. We worked a lot of work on that. Another big topic also was uh, uh, trying to timeline construction projects in the junior high and high school with the passage of the levy and, and how we want to do that. Uh, the phases of both both of those projects. Other topics um, were um, Clint talked a lot about the uh, state with, with, with the wraparound money with the mental health services, and uh, we talked a lot about state testing, like everybody else probably does all all the time, um, and some after school programs and things like that. So we touched on a lot of um, a lot of different topics. It was a very productive meeting. We were able to to uh, get a lot of ideas out. So it was a, I think it's a, a day worth worthwhile. So that was our meeting on the 10th of November. I have nothing on hearing of the public on agenda items. Uh, Mr. Hill, Treasurer's agenda. Were there any questions on the uh, monthly financial reports? The other item that I have is the um, 20, uh, it should be saying, yeah, the FY20 appropriations. Uh, that is what I told you we'd have this month after we approved the Fund 467 last month. Now we're going to update the appropriations uh, to turn into the county so that we can spend the 467 uh, student wellness funds that we're just talking about with mental health services, wraparound services. So that's just an update to the appropriations that you voted on in September. And then we'll get started on the five-year forecast. And I have a presentation. Many times you all hear me say, barring any unforeseen circumstances. And unfortunately, um, this time we have a few unforeseen circumstances. One thing that we've discussed already is that we have frozen state funding. So we know that we're not going to see any additional revenue coming from the state for the next two years. On top of that, there are some uh, additional unforeseen circumstances that came as part of this budget bill that I'll get into in further details. Um, but basically, uh, you can call it an unfunded mandate. You could call it um, the public, public publicization of private schools. Future uh, of health insurance is the third big thing that's going to impact our budget. Um, we went from an era of six to seven percent increases in health insurance to bank on at least a 13 percent increase every year. So uh, that's a big change, it's a big shift, and it's a lot of money when the board's picking up 85 percent of the bill. So you put those things together, when we can look at the revenue first, you'll see that the revenue in 2020 is nearing 40 million dollars. You look at the end of the forecast in 2024, 
And we're pretty much the same place that we were because we're going to lose money every year moving forward um, for multiple reasons. One of them being the, Thank you. the amount of money that we're receiving from the state is actually not going to stay level. It's going to be going down. And we'll talk some more about that as we go forward. So again, we were frozen for two years on something that we never actually fully received. And so one of the things that we need to understand in total is that the state of Ohio has refused to fund public schools properly for over 30 years. And then we're sitting here, we come up with a formula, and we don't give the school districts what we need, and we've been at the cap on the old formula. Then we decide that we're going to fr freeze public schools for two years and not give them any new state money. So we expect no state money except for these wellness funds. And I will say that as much as they are needed, <coughs> we don't spend this much money on wellness funds. We don't have this many programs in place. And we can't put new programs in place just because we have the money because they're going to pull it in two years. It's not going to exist. So in the meantime, we can't, we're not going to be able to pay our bills adequately but we're going to go ahead and give you this extra money to make it, make it better for two years, and then who knows what's going to happen next. If you look at our expenses, again, I had mentioned, if you look at the, the line with employee retirement and insurance benefits, it's going to keep going up, and it's going to go up by at least 13% every year. And so what is forecasted in here is 85% of the total, what we pay for insurance, 13 times more every year. And so you'll see that that line item goes from eight and a half million to eleven and a half million in four years. So after five years of zero percent increases, and let's talk about health insurance for a minute. We received a seventy point two percent increase in health insurance. Fortunately, we were able to work our way out of that and got it down to twenty seven point nine percent by negotiating new plan options new plan designs, and making adjustments to the board contribution to try to make sure that we kept our staff. I mean, if we would have took on, if we would have passed this on to our staff, we, we would be um, all driving buses in the mornings and cooking lunch and everything else because there would be nobody here to do it. And we were told to continue to expect these increases. How are we doing right now? Well, we're holding our own. But what we're not going to do is hold our own as we continue to see money funneled from public education to private education. And that's what's coming. An interpretation of the law that basically says, and that's not in here, it's in a, it's in a, I, w I wasn't going to go this deep into here, but I'm going to. The, the interpretation of the law basically states that our district is now going to have to fund private education for certain buildings in our, in our district. And the, by doing so, you're involving public funds to now pay for private education, which to me is completely unconstitutional. And, it, and it, it's just a further thing that the state has done to dismantle public education. They can't fund us right to begin with, and now on top of it, we're going to funnel money off of you to pay for private education. And there's no, and then while we're at it, we're going to freeze you. So you have no additional revenue anyways to pay for this. So it's automatically going to be a reduction in your revenues. This year, things are manageable. And it's going to be difficult next year. I think we might be able to balance the budget next year, maybe. But going forward after that, we're going to have to see what happens. We have to get through two years to see what the next biennium budget looks like. So I can't get too, too bent out of shape until I know what that looks like. But this is definitely the most catastrophic data that I've had on funding for public education in my 16 years of doing this work. This, what, where we're heading right now is absolutely out of control. And it is going to be detrimental to lots of districts. It's not, just, it's not just PICWA. It's lots of districts across this county. We're working closely with um, Hamilton and um, Middletown. I mean, there's districts. They're way bigger than we are that have a lot more on the line. Uh, but for us, we're talking about nearly $1 million being taken out of our budget annually 
for something that we have never had to pay for, which is private education. What is private education? It's a choice. It should be getting funded by public, with public dollars. So we'll keep monitoring it. We'll let you know how it goes. As we continue to go through that process, to me, it's unconstitutional. It's probably going to require some major lawsuits if the, if the legislature doesn't um, come up with a solution on their own as they see how upset they made public education. We're talking about 884 buildings across the state of Ohio that are in this situation. And um, again, the good news out of all this, because it's not a great forecast, is that we are on track. We've completed 12 years, and we will probably complete our 13th year of uh, non-deficit spending, but I can't give you any guarantees beyond that. Yes, Clint. Is uh, Now, this Ed Choice thing, I don't, I don't know a lot about it, I've heard, but is it also going to require us to also supply busing for students that choose somewhere else? We already, we already do supply mo the majority of the transportation. Um, there is another uh, private school that's already approached us about transporting their students next year. Um, and we've done that. Uh, it, we'll, we'll make it work one way or the other. Um, I'm not so concerned about that, like as the public, the private schools have done something to us. This is not them. Um, this is just a poor interpretation of a rule by a assistant state superintendent who hates public education. We have the fox guarding the hen house, and um, she wants nothing more than to just see the destruction of public education. And that's what's occurring right now. And our legislature, uh, especially in this area, are all in favor of it. They, they have no qualms with what's happening. So um, it, it's not going to get any better anytime soon. Uh, that there doesn't seem to be much care about what they're doing. It was pretty much pre-planned. And we've all sort of known that we've had a target on our back for a long time, that this state, for some reason, decides that public education is not important. And they continue to broadcast to the country how terrible their schools are <coughs> by giving them Fs on a flawed report card that they can't even get right, let alone fund their schools right. But they can throw the, they can throw the stones from Columbus, um, and, but don't really see the, what, the good work that goes on here. Uh, it makes me very frustrated to listen to this, because to say that all these schools are doing such a terrible job, I, it, it's hard to believe. It, it's hard to believe the amount of work that goes in today than it was when I was in school. Like it, the amount of time and work and effort that our teachers are putting in today is magnitudes bigger than what it was when I was in school. So I, I, it, the reason why we're failing is probably from a flawed system that was created by some people in Columbus. I don't think that our kids are any worse off today. I think that they're much better off today than they were, and they're just failing to see it. Uh, they, they have other plans, other motives. So the student money follows the students then? Absolutely. Okay. When did the grades go? Like, that goes first. Not the district-wide. It's per building, right? It's per building. But many districts are total. Covington, for example, is completely at oh, choice. Oh, okay. Bradford. And when do those grades, when does that come out? When, do, when will they know? They know. What building's in the, in the community? Uh, it's out. Okay. It's been, it was released. Um, so October 17th, the new budget bill took effect. We received word, I won't even say, but not, it's, I think tomorrow will be two weeks um, that, that this was happening and that the interpretation, the interpretation of the law had changed. Otherwise, it was kids entering kindergarten. So you would, you know, it's whatever students were entering into kindergarten, if they wanted to choose a, a private option, they were doing it that way. We had four, it was $18,600. I wasn't happy about it, but I wasn't gonna, you know, Torch the town over it, but we're talking about nearly a million dollars that is going to shift when we open school next year. So, what people need to realize is, is that when things get gerrymandered and one party has complete control of the state legislature, the House, the Senate, and the governor's spot, and nobody seems to care, this is the type of stuff that happens. We've got extremists. I mean, in the city side of it, the gun legislation that's coming out is crazy now. They've authorized the state senate or the government has authorized, authorized suing cities if they don't change their laws, gun laws, to conform with the state gun laws. And if you don't do that, a person can civilly sue the city. 
these are the type of things that are coming out. And when he gets to funding, you know, just so everybody knows, it's crazy. If you own a small business like I do, the state of Ohio decided several years ago that if you own 20% of a business and you get income from it, and it's an LLC or an S corporation, you don't have to pay any taxes to the state of Ohio. I brought this up to our state legislator this year, and then they changed the law uh, so lawyers and lobbyists could be taxed next year, but they didn't even have the guts to finish that. They backed off of it because the lawyers and lobbyists threatened to do it. But there are many people, such as myself, that pay no taxes to the state of Ohio. My wife does. Any income that I don't make from my employment is taxed, but it's crazy. I mean, it's, I don't even think it's right and I'm getting the break. But these are things that happen. And at some point, people need to pay attention. It's, it's just, when we can't even get the funding right to begin with, and then we dole out more and we freeze people and we, they're just, they're playing too many games. Nobody knows what to do. They don't know how long to expect it. I mean, you can't. I mean, I got to give you a five-year forecast, but I don't know what are they going to do tomorrow. I mean, this is, this is constantly something new. I mean, it. This is the stuff that we have to plan for. Well, obviously, moving forward now, we've got a lot of work <coughs> ahead of us. Um, it sounds, you know, we need to make a concerted effort to uh, make our state and national legislators aware of what they're doing to public education. And I think tonight the information you shared with us just brings that home all the, all the stronger that we, we all, all owe it to all the students in Ohio, not just here, to um, stand up and let the legislators know the damage you're doing to public education in Ohio. And it, you're, you're right, it's not just it, at the state level. We have the National Secretary of Education that's anti-public education education and we've got some legislators we have a congressman just down the road from us that grew up in public education is anti-public education but, um, the, the, the deck is th sort of stacked against us right now we've got to do our part to unstack that so I know that was a tough report for you to give tonight yeah I like to give good news <coughs> unfortunately this time it was uh, but not uh, as much. you know I, I think it was, it was something needed to be shared so uh, thank you for all of that I think <laughs> I, I get to be the bearer of news, that's all. Okay, anything else on, um, uh, on your agenda? Nope, that was everything. Okay, do we have a motion to approve the tre treasurer's agenda? So moved. Do we have a second? I have a motion and a second. If there's no further discussion, um, please signify by your approval by saying aye. 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 Opposed? Okay, motion carries, thank you. And superintendent's report. Thank you. Tonight's building spotlight will be <clears throat> at Virginia High School. Mr. Jeff Clark is here to talk to us about the work they're doing. Thank you. Thanks, Jeremy. I know, I appreciate it. I'm all fired up here. Um, uh, thank you for the opportunity to uh, share some brief comments regarding um, Pickle Junior High Schools efforts this year and academic achievement and also attendance was another focus that we brought to the beginning of the school year so as a building our two goals were academic achievement and, and attendance so we're going to just give you some brief highlights of what our work has been so far and where we're heading so under can you see i, I know i need to stand by the mic can okay. i should i move it and, no. okay so uh, in in terms of academic academic achievement um, a lot of work goes on every day Things I've listed and I'm going to talk about are in supplement to and in complement to the day-to-day -day excellent instruction that we have going on in our classes, but wanted to touch base with some things that we're doing. Started the year very early with uh, Mr. Bloom coming out and meeting with all of our departments. Uh, actually, it was the first week of September. Uh, we spent half, each department spent a half day with Scott and myself going through a whole list of uh, different items to try to get us off to a good start and a good, have a good focus for the rest of the school year. I have for you listed the, the agenda items that we covered. State testing, uh, item looking, at, looking at the item analysis and release questions from last year's tests. Um, going over our curriculum audit that we completed last year to understand where our holes were that we needed to focus on this year. 
Um, also looking at our short cycle assessment process and then also making sure we took a good look at all of our resources that we're using in all the different content areas. And I have some of those, those listed up there. So really good work done early. That's two years in a row I think we've done that. And I appreciate Mr. Bloom coming out and working with our staff. They really enjoy that opportunity to spend some time digging into those things. So we appreciate that. Part of what we did that those days was to talk about what we're, we were going to do the remainder of the year in our teacher-based teams. Uh, our teacher-based teams are all by department. And so we made some adjustments this year for our teacher-based teams. We moved to bi-weekly meetings. So we're meeting every two weeks instead of our monthly meetings that we've done in the past. The, the point of that being we could look at and act on data more quickly. And, and when we were meeting monthly, we felt like by the time we were looking at data, uh, we had moved on with some of the content that we were teaching and it was hard to go back and naturally kind of um, intervene where we needed to. So we, we were meeting more frequently and, and able to intervene more, more quickly in those, in those scenarios. Also making sure in those TBT meetings that are happening every two weeks by department that we're using our Procore short cycle data. We'll talk about what we've done in short with uh, Procore a little bit later as well, but really using stu really quality student data to drive what we're doing. And then working as a department to come up with what are we going to do differently in the classroom at moving forward. That, that was a real push. Again, going back to the PD day with Scott, really making sure we came out of those meetings with a plan, not just admiring data. So really much more targeted, focused meetings. In terms of Procore usage, we know that Procore is very well aligned to state standards. It's also very well aligned to the assessment. So we want to make sure we're using that as, as um, effectively as possible. And again, all of our core content areas are using Procore to do uh, short cycle assessments with their students, both pre and post. So they'll test them before they teach a standard. And then once that standard has been taught, they'll test them again and see what kind of growth we've made, and also do we need to go back and reteach and, and able to do that when we need to. We've given, we've uh, increased our amount of Procore tests this year assessments by 30%. Um, our students have taken, students probably don't like to see that, but 10,359 assessments this year uh, up to this point, which last year we were right at eight. Um, continuing with academic, academic achievement focus, one of the things that we spent actually going back to last summer with our language arts teachers uh, doing was talking about um, the implementation of one of our resources, Springboard. Springboard um, is a resource that is, uh, was previously only used with our advanced English language arts sections. It's a very rigorous resource. You can see in my notes there, it's aligned to the standards. It's also uh, very much tied to AP coursework that students might um, experience in high school and also with SAT. It's actually uh, produced by College Board. So it's very well vetted. It's very, very rigorous. It gets students to a very high depth of knowledge. And so what we've done this year is not only uh, utilize that in our advanced language arts classes, but also most of our general uh, English language arts classes in seventh and eighth grade. So our language arts teacher spent multiple days last summer here in the board office working with Scott and, and going through how do we implement this resource, not just with our advanced students, but also with our general ELA students. And it's going very well so far. Not a lot of data yet, it's early. Um, Springboard includes multiple um, assessments along the way. We haven't hit a lot of those yet, but we will, we will be and we'll be reviewing that data. Um, IXL is an online resource that we use, also tied to standards, uh, also tied to um, the, the, very much like the, the state test that students will um, experience in the spring. You can see there the numbers that we've, used, that we've got so far this year. A lot of questions answered by our students. Different levels of success, at least practiced 18,000 skills, proficient on 10,000 and almost 3,000 skills that students have mastered uh, so far this school year. So we're excited about that data as well. And that's in math, English language arts and science, both grades, both seventh and eighth grade. Next step for us, Scott actually started this process for us today, uh, working with our departments and our TBTs to look at the Ohio model curriculum that is attached to all the new standards and making sure we're using that resource. A lot there for our teachers in terms of um, content elaborations and also instructional supports that they can use. Again, the, the, the assessments that the students take at the end of the year are based on these, these model curriculum. So making sure we're using those so students are experiencing Type of instruction that they're going to be assessed on at the end of the year. So that's the next step starting that actually as of today. 
So that's kind of that's a quick wrap up of the attendance uh, or excuse me the achievement um, focus with our attendance focus. Again, this is in in addition to everything we already do anyway, and, and things that are set forth by the the um, attendance laws in the state of Ohio. We were lucky enough to receive a thousand dollar Walmart grant this year, focused on uh, an attendance incentive program. We're doing monthly, quarterly, and a, an end of year drawing for students that meet the 95 percent which is our success bound goal that we've set with students they know that's the magic number that we're kind of setting for everything so students at the end of the first month of school who had a 95 percent attendance um, or better were in a drawing for a gift card uh, and same thing for the quarter and I, I believe we're giving away televisions at the end of the year is, is what we have decided on quarterly recognition uh, for attendance we're making sure we, we've always uh, recognized students with perfect attendance <coughs> Perfect attendance is a pretty high standard to reach and, and not necessarily what our success bound uh, plan really focused on. It, it focused on excellent attendance and we described that as 95% or better. So making sure we recognize those kids who are meeting or exceeding that, that mark. And you'll see that later about uh, how many students we have that are meeting that target. And it's also a, a component of our Pickwa Pride program. We do a quarterly in, uh, incentive program that's based on academics, attendance and behavior. And the attendance piece is at least 95% attendance for students to qualify for that program. They get privileges like front of the lunch line. If you've been to our building, you can see, you've seen the tables out front. Students can sit outside and eat at lunch so they can earn those kind of privileges. Intervention measures, again, aside from what the state tells us we have to do, which is always too late and not enough. Um, kind of going on your theme, Jeremy. Um, what, we, what we've done so far this year is I've utilized our school messenger system to um, on a monthly basis Mindy Gerhardt is great and gives us monthly reports on where our students are with attendance so any student that is identified as chronically absent which is which means missing more than 10 percent of the school year gets a text message from me and it's just a reminder to their parents hey your student has missed at least 10 percent of the school year attendance is very important please call me if you have any questions just kind of an informational thing I've gotten some phone calls and had some nice conversations with parents about attendance. A lot of, wow, I didn't realize it was that much kind of thing, and we see improvement from that. Not as much as we'd like to, but we've seen some. We also, uh, at, um, our, it was two weeks ago at our team meetings, we meet weekly in cross-curricular uh, teams, and we took our whole list of students who were 10% or more absent, so our chronically absent students, we took them in our team meeting, and every student was essentially adopted by a teacher and said I'm going to connect with this kid and talk to them about their attendance and just start to try to build a connection and a relationship with that with that student it was interesting most students we, we have an advisory period at Pickwood Junior High School kind of like the old home homeroom type period most of our uh, teachers took students who were in their advisory period but we had multiple times when somebody said hey I had that kid last year and I really connected with him, so I'll, I'll take him, I'll talk to him in the hallway, I'll, I'll, I'll grab him. So now we're reviewing that on a monthly basis to see if we see improvement with that. So we haven't gotten to that review yet. That's gonna be coming up here at the beginning of December when we get November numbers. So we're excited about that. Again, focusing on connection with people, with kids and with parents to try to get an improvement with attendance. Where are we now currently? Um, as of November 18th, I think was the latest report, Mindy sent us 62% of our students are 95% or better with their attendance, which we're excited about. I don't know if I would have had a target for that. We've never really tracked it that way. That seemed, that seemed positive to me. We'll see how that goes. I, hopefully we'll see it improve. We have at that current time, we have 15.8% of our students who are chronically absent. That means they've missed 10% or more. That's not good. That's not where we want to be. We ended last year on our state report card, it's actually 18%. So it is an improvement over where we were last year. So we're seeing improvement and we hope to continue to see more. One of the things I always look at is just on a day-to-day -day basis, what's our attendance? We have over 95% attendance on a daily basis at the junior high, which um, the state report card used to be uh, the average daily attendance and I think the mark was 93%. And we hovered anywhere from 93, 94. Occasionally we'd hit 95, so we're doing a good job with our average daily attendance. So that's the academic and attendance update. Any questions? Sounds like you've been busy. You've been busy. Hmm. Thank you. I would just add that attendance across the district is a struggle for us, and it has been the last couple of years, especially as legislation is pulled back. So um, <clears throat> we really need parent support. We really need parents 
to help us get the students in the school. It's, it's not just making up work. It's missing those important communication skills, interactions with teachers, asking questions, getting answers back, the hands-on experiences. All those things seem at the learning, and without a student being in school and being present, we don't get that advantage. So we really need that parental support there. We do have a business advisory council, and that is um, many local businesses and manufacturing companies that come and give us some great advice and support some of the work we do. And Mr. Bostic is on that as a board representative, and he'll give an update on our last meeting. Yeah, the last meeting was very interesting. The uh, students at the high school in the um, media art classes are going to be making signs for businesses in our area that want to get involved and get on board supporting and possibly taking some of our students for apprenticeships. Well, not full time, but they may go as little as like an hour, one day a week. They may go every day for certain hours. They work up to it. But the students are making signs and posting them down on the 500 wing. And um, that also allow students to see they can have informative signs, you know, for job opportunities and things like that, which is a great idea for our students to, to get that experience. Um, Steve Grasso talked about the pre-apprenticeship program. Uh, Mr. Matt Longfellow from Ohio Apprenticeship was at the meeting and he's working with the schools and they're looking to place students. So if any businesses are interested out there, the possibility please give uh, Mr. Messick a call at the high school because they're always looking for different, uh, you know, the more varied things that we can get our students in that might really uh, create that spark that really spurs them to, to motivate them to really get moving in those areas. We had a gentleman, Mr. Ron Adler from the Dayton STEM workforce came and, and talked to our group. The one thing about that program though, the student and the parents have to attend everything. So, you know, that, that kind of cuts some of our kids out of that that may not, you know, have the parental support for that. So, you know, but he did offer, and, and that was interesting. Another thing they talked about was Manufacturing Day, I guess was a great success. It was a day where they had parents and students go to look at different businesses around Piqua, and they got to tour and see how they operate, um, find out about jobs, and I mean, they're out there. You know, if you drive down 75, it's, it's like every other company is, is asking for workers. So... We're trying to uh, kind of feed our students into that, that, that fit in that area and want that. So, so it's a great experience for them. And I mean, Rob and his staff out there doing, it, it's a great job on that. It really is bringing that to life. Thank you. This week, the Apollo Learning Center came to see the high school in action. Um, they had heard about the great work they're doing with Success Bound out there. And the high school's been invited to talk at Sinclair in March as well about their um, success bound programs. So a lot of good things out there happening and people are noticing that. So we're really proud of that work. Um, just a couple of announcements. Um, last um, board meeting, you guys approved the sale of the um, Old Favorite Hill property, which is at 950 South Street. And that auction will happen on Tuesday, December the 10th at 10 a.m. on the site. So anybody that's interested in seeing the information about that can go to our website at just www.pickwood.org. They can go to the link that says bid and they can get all the information about the property and the lots. Um, and again, if they want to make a bid, they can come that day at 10 a.m. on Tuesday, December the 10th. Is Mr. Hiddle going to be the auctioneer? Again? He will be the auctioneer, <laughs> yep. Um, the, <laughs> the senior breakfast is coming up on December the 7th and that will be at um, the Piqua Central Intermediate School again. So all senior citizens are welcome to come to that. Um, one of the great features of that event, of course, is the show choir that will perform at 9 a.m. Breakfast is a good menu. It'll be scrambled eggs, sausage links, biscuits and gravy, waffles, fresh fruit, juice, and coffee. And again, if they want information on that, they can go to our website and all the details are located there, free of charge for all of our senior citizens. Finally, we'd like to talk about our music programs. We have several of them coming up, some really good ones. At the Pickle High School is the Holiday Concert and Cookie Walk on Sunday, December 8th. We have the um, band concert for the junior high school and the Pickle High School, which will be at PHS on December 9th. The Pickle Junior High School has a holiday concert on December 10th, and then Spring Creek will have their holiday concert on the 19th. Washington did a veterans program. Spring Creek is gonna do a Christmas program. So those are all located on the website again. We love when the community comes to see our students' talent, and our students have a lot of great talent to share. So wanted to get that information out there. And that's it. Okay.
Um, go ahead with the superintendent's agenda. Just like to recommend the attached list of donations for Pickle City Schools. Uh, we have Park Bank, French Oil, Jackson Tube, the Friends of the Pickle Library, Pioneer Electric, Hartzell Propeller, Kiwanis Club, and Meyer Restoration, all donated to student programs. Okay, anything else to add? That's it. Okay, do we have a motion to approve the superintendent's agenda? So moved. Okay, we got a motion. We have a second. Second. Okay, uh, <clears throat> there a motion and a second. If there's no further discussion, all in favor, please signify your approval by <coughs> saying aye. 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 Opposed? Okay, motion carries. Thank you. Mr. Lyons, personnel agenda. Uh, short agenda uh, this month. Um, the one thing I want to focus on is as we get into winter months, we are increasingly in need of substitute teachers. Um, we just got a list from the county that had been approved recently, so you can find out information about how to become a substitute teacher in the district on the um, employment um, tab, and also just contact me uh, at the board office, and it's as simple as an interview for me and then getting them directed to the Miami County ESC. Um, outside of that, um, volunteering, if you're going to do an overnight trip uh, or spend time outside of the building, you will need to be fingerprinted here at the board office. Other than that, coming in for a day to be in a classroom or something, we can use the Raptor system at the, uh, at the building level. Uh, real quick on the, sub mm -hmm. on the substitute, what requirements do, uh, do a substitute have to meet? To you have to hold a bachelor's degree. Uh, we like to have people who are in education, but increasingly that's not... Uh, our reality so we try to encourage people that are a have a bachelor's degree but maybe interested in education or those people that generally like to be with kids um, and then come and see us let's talk through and, and see if it's a, a good fit okay anything else to add nothing from me okay uh, do we have a motion to approve the uh, personnel agenda we have a motion do we have a second second have a motion in a second. If there's no further discussion, uh, please signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed? Okay, motion carries. If there's no old business to carry over, uh, new business. So we'd like to recommend the board approval of the attached proclamation by the Pickle City's um, Board of Education. And uh, Mr. Patrizio has that, and I'm going to ask that he would read that um, for everybody to hear. I can bring my glasses, but that's okay. Um, the proclamation is for Eleanor Gatcho. Eleanor Gatcho actually was a Piqua High School, Central High School graduate. Graduate. She graduated in 1919. She just passed away recently, and I saw, and she was 108 years old. But I'm assuming at the time she passed away, she had to be the oldest Piqua alumnus. That I'm aware of, yeah. Uh, her brother, an, inter an interesting story, lived to be about 95, and he was the Surgeon General's worst nightmare. He smoked every day like a chain, so I'm a chain smoker. But, um, she was an avid bridge player. She was a teacher in the district uh, from 1933 to, I believe, 1976. She, uh, uh, I'll try and read this. Um, recognized her commitment to the community by returning to Pickwood, becoming a teacher at Spring Street School, North Street, Bennett Junior High, Wilder Junior High, and Pickwood City School District recognizes the extraordinary example of high expectations, hard work, self-motivation, and effort demonstrated by Eleanor Gatchill throughout her career at Pickwood City School District. Uh, the Pickwood City School District honors Eleanor Gatchill and celebrates her 108 years of life by recognizing her life, spirit, and joy this day, November 21st, 2019. Eleanor was also an avid bridge player, and I played against her probably up to about five years ago. I saw her. She was in assisted living recently, and she was still very, prior to her passing away, I saw her probably about six months before them, was very aware of who I was and knew everything and, and was in really uh, great shape other than at some point I guess your body gives out. Uh, she is being nominated for a Senior Citizen Hall of Fame by Bob Black and a committee. Uh, her granddaughters, I think, actually graduated, her great-granddaughters graduated from Piqua last year. Her grandson has graduated from Piqua, and I believe her mother or her daughter also graduated from Piqua. She still has strong family ties in the district, and I ask for the approval or recognition of all. Good. Do we have a motion to approve that? Uh 
Proclamation. Okay, do we have a second? Second. <clears throat> we have a motion and a second. All in favor, please signify by saying aye. 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 Motion carried. Please share that with, with the family. And going back and getting information on her from her file, it was interesting. There were about six letters between the district and the state. They were trying to, she had a secondary certification and they wanted her to teach kindergarten. So they had to get special permission and there were these very formal letters written back and forth and dated and mailed. And I thought how easy it is now with email and picking up the phone, but they, they, they took months to get that result because they were typing and writing these formal letters, sending it to the state, the state would read it and write one back and then the district wrote one and they went back and forth for, for months to get her to teach kindergarten and, and they, they finally got it resolved, but very interesting. One of the documents I saw was she had a teacher evaluation it was from her principal, who was Harry Ashburn, who is still alive. He's in his mid-90s. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and it was kind of interesting to read that. I kind of laughed when I and smiled when I saw his name. Great legacy. Okay, I have nothing on hearing of the public for non-agenda items. Um, we'll remind people before we move into executive session that our next board meeting will be Wednesday, December 11th, here at the board office at 6 p.m. And now do we have a motion to move into executive session and we will not be taking action when we come out. So moved. We have a motion, we have a second. We have a motion and a second. All in favor, please signify, signify by saying aye. 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 Okay, thank you. I won't be here.